México es un país independiente y libre, no una colonia ni un protectorado de Estados Unidos. Some pretty amazing things are happening in Mexico. This is a country that for decades had a series of governments that were very obedient to the United States. But the leftist president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, known as AMLO, AMLO, he has been speaking out very forcefully against the threats by the United States, the bullying by the United States. And more recently, this March, numerous U.S. politicians have been calling essentially for the U.S. military to invade Mexico. I should keep in, I should stress here that Mexico is the one of the top three most important trading partners of the United States. They share a massive border and multiple U.S. politicians from the Republican Party are now calling for the U.S. military to invade Mexico in the name of fighting drug cartels. And the current president, AMLO, is not simply taking this lying down. He is being very forceful in rejecting these U.S. threats. And he has given powerful speeches saying, Mexico is not a U.S. colony. We are not going to tolerate this aggressive behavior by these hypocrites in Washington. Pero lo más importante es que desde aquí, desde este Zócalo, corazón político y cultural de México, le recordamos a esos políticos hipócritas e irresponsables que México es un país independiente y libre, no una colonia ni un protectorado de Estados Unidos. Y que podrán amenazarnos con cometer cualquier atropello, pero jamás, jamás permitiremos que violen nuestra soberanía y pisoteen la dignidad de nuestra patria. Cooperación, sí, sometimiento, no. Interventionismo. No. And at these rallies, AMLO has also been celebrating the Mexican government's nationalization, the expropriation of oil and lithium, which belonged previously to foreign corporations and now belongs to the Mexican people. Y recientemente se nacionalizó el litio, mineral estratégico utilizado en la construcción de baterías para autos eléctricos y sistema de almacenamiento para las energías limpias. Me llena de orgullo poder recordar justicia social, igualdad, soberanía, viva la expropiación petrolera. Vivan los trabajadores y técnicos de antes y de ahora de la industria petrolera nacional. AMLO made those very forceful remarks on March 18th at a rally that he held in the center of Mexico City, which is known as the Zócalo, the main plaza, Constitution Plaza. And there he held an event honoring the 85th anniversary of the expropriation of oil by the former leftist president, Lázaro Cárdenas. Video of the rally shows how enormous it was, just flooding downtown the sea of people. The helicopter shots are absolutely incredible. In 1938, the Mexican oil reserves had belonged largely to foreign corporations and Cárdenas, this revolutionary leftist leader, he nationalized it, expropriated it, and made it the public property of the Mexican people. Viva el general Lázaro Cárdenas del Río! Viva México! Viva México! Viva México! Viva! 
this has direct parallels to today because in 2022, the Mexican government nationalized lithium, the large lithium reserves in Mexico, which are being overseen by the state publicly owned. And lithium has been referred to as the white gold. It is very important for developing renewable energy technology, batteries for all kinds of technologies like cars and computers and phones. And as a clear example of AMLO drawing parallels between the government of Cárdenas in the 1930s and his government today, he pointed out that after Cárdenas expropriated the oil wealth in Mexico in 1938, that millionaires requested a U.S. military intervention. And millionaires went and complained so the United States would invade Mexico to protect their companies. And then AMLO said very sarcastically, he said, huh, that sounds familiar. Los millonarios pedían que fuera la intervención. A los Estados Unidos fueron a poner su queja. No suena, no suena, no suena. I wanted to talk about this today because I think it's very much worth the time. Mexico is the 10th most populous country on earth. It's a very important country. And there's so much racism in the United States that treats it as if, as if it's not important, as if it's, you know, just a U.S. colony. So it's really important to push back against that. I translated most of AMLO's speech into English and I published it over at geopoliticaleconomy.com. I have a link in the description below. Today I'm going to show some clips, but I didn't want to show too many clips because I'm trying to make these videos shorter, not longer. And he spoke for an hour and there's there's so many amazing things that he said in the speech. So you can go check out the translation there and I will read some parts of his speech later on here. I also did uh, another re related episode recently looking at a speech that AMLO gave condemning the U.S. State Department for meddling in Mexico's internal affairs. And he said, Mexico is more democratic than the United States because the U.S. is run by the oligarchy. Que hay más democracia actualmente en México que en Estados Unidos. Es porque aquí gobierna el pueblo. Allá gobierna la oligarquía. I will also link to that episode in the description below. Now, I should stress here that AMLO is one of the most popular leaders in the world. He has consistently had an approval rating of between 60 and 70 percent since he came to power in late 2018. In December, he had a 72 percent approval rating, which is I mean, just double the approval rating of most Western leaders. We should keep that in mind while we listen to the extremely aggressive rhetoric of U.S. politicians from Congress, considering the U.S. Congress has an 18 percent approval rating consistently. And in 2013, it had an, a 9 percent approval rating. So these are the people who are threatening to invade Mexico because they hate Mexico's democratically elected leftist president with a 70% approval rating. The proposals for the US military to invade Mexico are being led by the Republican Congressman Dan Crenshaw, and he has actually introduced legislation calling for the US military to intervene in Mexico in, in the name of fighting cartels. And in order to do so, he's citing the 9-11 era authorization for use of military force. This was passed a week after the September 11th attacks. And since then, the U.S. has used it again and again and again to justify waging war around the world. Now, Republicans in the U.S. are trying to use it to justify invading the U.S.'s southern neighbor. Dan Crenshaw published an insane article in USA Today calling for the U.S. military to invade Mexico. And he compared drug cartels to Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. And he said that they are basically, they're ISIS. He compared them to ISIS and Al Qaeda and said that they're terrorist organizations. And he said that we need to t target these narco terrorists on all fronts financially with increased criminal penalties and even militarily. He boasts of proposing several pieces of legislation to authorize the U.S. military to invade Mexico. And he calls one of the pieces of legislation the Declaring War on the Cartels Act. So 
I mean, it's like the war on drugs, but now they just say war on cartels, which is basically the same thing. So Republicans are trying to bring back the failed war on drugs. And furthermore, in this article, he calls for the U.S. government to impose sanctions on Mexico. Again, it's southern neighbor. It's it's top three most important trading partner. He's calling for to impose sanctions on Mexico. So already one quarter of the entire global population lives in countries that are illegally sanctioned by the U.S. And these Republicans want to increase that even further. I mean, so do some Democrats. But this let's be clear, this is a Republican driven effort here. In a press release on his website, this congressman, Dan Crenshaw, said claimed that Mexico is a failed narco state. And he called for waging war on the cartels and say we must start treating them like ISIS because that is who they are. The far right Trumpist wing of the Republican Party is also totally on board with this call for war on Mexico, which is ironic because they've been trying to rebrand as supposedly anti-war. And Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is one of the most far right fascistic politicians in the United States, who ironically, again, has tried to portray herself as anti-war, she's now calling for the U.S military to wage war on Mexico. So this is always what fascists do. They, you know, they criticize, they claim to be opposed to certain wars, but that's because they want to wage war at home. She doesn't want the war in, Me in, in, in Ukraine. She wants the war in Mexico. She wants the war on the southern border. And she says that very clearly. Now, as an example of the weapons of mass destruction, WMD style fake news propaganda that these Republicans are spreading, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene published a photo on Twitter of something weird, like a ball wrapped in duct tape. And she claimed that it's an explosive found by Border Patrol agents. And she said that it was confirmed that it was brought in by the cartel. This changes everything. And then she says that the cartels are planting bombs on our land in our country. Our U.S. military needs to take action against the Mexican cartels. Well, in reality, it might not surprise you to hear that Marjorie Taylor Greene was lying. It was complete fake news and that the chief of U.S. Border Patrol admitted that it was actually a duct taped ball filled with sand that wasn't deemed a threat to agents or the public. But this is, again, the WMD style lie that these Republicans are using to try to justify a military invasion of Mexico. Now, Marjorie Taylor Greene is, of course, someone who believes in the fascist QAnon conspiracy theory. And so, I mean, it's not surprising to, to see that she just completely makes stuff up and, and is spreading ridiculous fake news. But in another tweet, she made it clear that this so-called anti-war, so-called populist Republican actually wants more war. She said, there is a war going on that affects every single American, but it's not in Ukraine or the Middle East. It's on our southern border. And she said that she's proud to co-sponsor Representative Dan Crenshaw's legislation to declare a war on the Mexican cartels, calling for authorizing the use of military force. The Republican Senator Lindsey Graham is doing exactly the same thing. He gave a press conference in March in which he said, we are going to unleash the fury and might of the U.S. against these cartels. He's called for giving the U.S. military the authority to go after these organizations wherever they exist. He compared them to ISIS and Al Qaeda and called them narco terrorists. But the most insane call came from Donald Trump's foreign former CIA director and former secretary of state, Mike Pompeo, who famously said that as the head of CIA, we lied, we cheated, we stole. What's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. Hmm. I, I, I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, and stole. It's, it was like, we, we, had, we, had entire, we had entire training courses. Uh, Mike Pompeo boasted that as Secretary of State under Trump, he called for using drones to attack Mexico. Pompeo spelled this out very clearly in an article called It is Time for America to Declare War on the Drug Cartels. He claimed that Mexico has a total lack of sovereignty, which again shows this colonialist mentality of the U.S. They see Mexico basically as a colony. Bringing back George W. Bush's War on Terror, Mike Pompeo called for the U.S. government to recognize Mexican cartels as terrorist organizations. So they're bringing back the war on terror. 
which of course, like the war on drugs, was a complete failure and led to just countless, m destroying millions of people's lives, countless misery, endless destruction. But you know, that's, that's why they want to bring it back because it was very profitable. After bragging of use, uh, suggesting that the U.S. should use drones to attack Mexico, he concluded this article, Pompeo, referring to the cartels as narco terrorists and say they demand the full spectrum of American power, referring, uh, referencing this neoconservative rhetoric of full spectrum dominance. And then maybe the most insane part of this article is he tries to bring in China. You know, Mike Pompeo. He, in many ways, you could say he started the new Cold War on China under Donald Trump. He gave a speech at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library declaring the new Cold War on China, saying that the U.S. government, its goal is regime change to overthrow the Communist Party of China. And at the end of this article, he says that the U.S. must destroy these narco terrorists. And in order to do so, it will require going after the Chinese Communist Party backed entities that are funneling precursor compounds to cartels. So this is so similar to the Bush era WMD lies, where these neocons, these Republicans in the Bush administration with support from Democrats like Joe Biden spread the lie that Osama, that, uh, Osama bin Laden had been working with Saddam Hussein, a complete lie, and that Saddam Hussein was supporting Al Qaeda and all this nonsense. And it's so similar now they're trying to link the Chinese government to Mexican drug cartels to justify not only attacking Mexico, but also waging war on China. And Mike Pompeo published a memoir in which he said he admitted that the, the Trump administration tried to overthrow the Venezuelan government in this regime change operation. And he said very clearly why. It's because Venezuela put out the welcome mat for Russia, China, Iran, Cuba and the cartels in a 21st century violation of the Monroe Doctrine. So this is the former CIA director and head of the U.S. State Department invoking the 200 year old colonial Monroe Doctrine that goes back to 1823 in order to justify the U.S. trying to overthrow Venezuela's democratically elected sovereign government. And he not only does he try to link Venezuela to Russia, China, Iran and Cuba, but he also tries to link Venezuela to drug cartels. So it shows this is all part of like this WMD style fake news psychological warfare operation to try to convince people that Venezuela and any other country that the in China and any other country that the US wants to overthrow is supposedly in some conspiracy with drug cartels and drug cartels are supposedly narco terrorists and therefore China and Venezuela are supporting terrorism and therefore the US war on terror is going to justify overthrowing those governments using the 9-11 era authorization of use of military force. This is the exact narrative that Republican Congress people in the US are pushing to justify invading Mexico. Obviously, Mexican President López Obrador is very angry about this, and he's given several speeches condemning U.S. politicians, saying that Mexico is not a U.S. colony. And, you know, this latest speech on March 18th is one of many examples. However, what was also unique about this event, this rally that AMLO held on March 18th in the heart of Mexico City, is it was not only a rejection of these US threats to invade Mexico and a defense of his country's sovereignty. So it wasn't only responsive, it was also affirmative. He was affirming support for Mexico's revolutionary history going back to the revolution that began in 1910. And AMLO was drawing parallels between his government and the legacy, the historical legacy of the Mexican Revolution and the leftist leaders who followed like Lázaro Cárdenas and Francisco Madero. And the, he talked about the legacy historically of the U.S. government meddling in Mexico's internal affairs, organizing coups and working with right wing oligarchs and foreign corporations to violate the country's sovereignty. Sostengo que hagan lo que hagan no regresarán al poder los oligarcas. I translated much of AMLO's speech and I want to just read through some of the main parts where he talks about the legacy of Lázaro Cárdenas and draws parallels between what happened to him and what's going on to AMLO today. 
And this is a photo of Cárdenas in 1937 when he nationalized the railroads in Mexico, which many of them had belonged to foreign corporations and he nationalized them one year before nationalizing the oil reserves. So AMLO explained, I'm just going to read through parts of his speech here. It's much faster than translating and putting subtitles, which is a lot of work. General Lázaro Cárdenas did not hesitate to rely on those below to carry out his transformation. The general's strategy can be summarized in three important consecutive actions. First, he gave land to the peasants and helped the workers. Then he motivated them to organize. And finally, with that social base, he was able to carry out the expropriation of the oil and other national resources. And he notes that before the right-wing dictator, Porfirio Diaz, had given away Mexico's natural resources to foreigners, to foreign corporations. So he's praising Cárdenas for working with the workers and the peasants, encouraging them to organize to resist foreign corporations and imperialism. And uh, he talks about the Cardenista strategy. The Cardenistas are those who follow Lázaro Cárdenas. And in many ways, you could say that AMLO is a Cardenista, a neo-Cardenista, right? And in the Cardenista strategy, the most important thing was the economic and social demands of the peasants and workers. That's what AMLO says. And again, this reflects his leftist nationalist ideology. And he's very similar to leaders who were overthrown historically by the United States, like Patrice Lumumba in Congo, or like Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala, or like uh, Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran, who were all overthrown in the CIA-backed coups. Now, AMLO continues in this speech. He says, It is undoubtable that the peasants saw in Cárdenas a faithful representative of the revolutionary cause, the agrarian reform ensured that many people were loyal to the Cardenista government, and from then on, there was an alliance between the peasants and the state. Moreover, during Cardenismo, which is, you know, like Chavismo, right? Chavismo was the political movement created by Venezuela's revolutionary president, Hugo Chavez. Cardenismo is the political movement created by Lázaro Cárdenas in the 1930s in Mexico. And AMLO says that during Cardenismo, Mexican workers felt that their labor rights were guaranteed with strict adherence to the law. Cárdenas respected the economic struggle of workers for better salaries and better labor conditions. AMLO said, the organization and political mobilization of the masses advanced the goal of valuing the economic independence of our country. Thereby, with the expropriation of the oil corporations, national goods and resources were returned to the nation, which since the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz had been in the hands of foreigners. So he's emphasizing that in order to accomplish the nationalization, the expropriation of these resources, Cardenas had to have the support of the Mexican working class. And of course, he's drawing parallels today to today with his nationalization of the lithium and his renationalization of oil. I should point out that Mexico's president, Enrique Peña Nieto, who governed from 2012 until 2018 from the neoliberal PRI party, he partially privatized Mexico's oil industry. And Enrique Peña Nieto is basically just a complete U.S. puppet. He did whatever the U.S. wanted to do, and the U.S. government encouraged him to partially privatize the oil industry. So when AMLO won the 2018 election, he had campaigned promising he was going to renationalize the oil, and that was one of the main um, promises that his government and it, that, that it had, and it did fulfill. He did renationalize the oil, and he also nationalized Mexico's lithium. Now, in the speech that AMLO gave on March 18th, he continued and he says, There has not existed in Mexico a president as close to humble people as General Cárdenas, nor a president as dedicated to the cause of social justice. And he notes that in, in 1935, Cárdenas wrote, quote, Ending the mis miseries that the people suffer from is above all other interests. And here... There's a very interesting part of the speech that AMLO gave, and he uses the term, the I word, imperialism, to quote Cárdenas. And he points out that Cárdenas understood that when he nationalized oil, 
that there was a very real possibility of the U.S. government trying to invade Mexico or trying to attack Mexico to prevent the expropriation of the oil companies, the U.S. oil companies operating in Mexico. So Cardenas, the revolutionary Mexican former president, he wrote, quote, and, and AMLO was citing this. this is, these are the words that Cardenas wrote, quote, we made considerations of the circumstances that could arise if governments like those of England and the United States, in the interest of supporting the oil companies, pressured the government of Mexico with violent measures. But we also took into account that there is already the threat of a new world war with the growing provocations of Nazi fascist imperialism, and that this would stop them from attacking Mexico in the case of the expropriation, among other re reasons. And then on, in, in response, on March 18, 1938, Cárdenas carried out the oil expropriation. So he made the assessment that the U.S. was not able to intervene because that World War II was clearly on the horizon. This was in 1938, one year before Nazi Germany started World War II by invading Poland. But Japan had already been attacking China. It was very clear, you know, the Spanish Civil War was going on from 1936 until 1939. And by the way, Cárdenas, along with the Soviet Union, those are the only countries in the world, Cárdenas's, Cárdenas's government in Mexico and the Soviet Union were the only countries in the world that sent weapons to the Spanish Republic that was fighting against the fascists led by Francisco Franco and backed by Hitler's Germany. So again, Mexico had a very leftist revolutionary government at the time. And the reason that he was able to nationalize the oil is because the U.S. was so focused on preparing for World War II, it wasn't able to attack Mexico. Although AMLO, AMLO also points out that another reason was that at the time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president, FDR, and, you know, he's one of the more progressive presidents in U.S. history, although, you know, there still are a lot of valid criticisms of FDR. Now, uh, finally, AMLO said in this speech that Cárdenas, he made this uh, announcement public on radio announcing that they were expropriating the oil and Cardenas said and AMLO quoted him Cardenas said quote imperialist capital has been taking advantage of the oil to uh, the oil wealth to keep Mexico in a humili humiliating situation so we see the current president of Mexico using the words imperialist capital I mean something that sounds like Fidel Castro, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible to hear the leader of Mexico making these comments. But it shows that one, I mean, AMLO has always been a leftist, a leftist nationalist, a progressive leader, but also the more that the US threatens Mexico and these, these Republicans call for invading Mexico, AMLO is being more assertive and even more revolutionary in, in his speeches in condemning US imperialism. Then AMLO pointed out that after Cárdenas expropriated Mexico's oil, quote, the millionaires requested a U.S. intervention. They complained to the United States. And AMLO said with a sarcastic tone, he said, well, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. Los millonarios pedían que fuera la intervención. A los Estados Unidos fueron a poner su queja. No suena, no suena, no suena. So as I pointed out earlier, this is a clear example of AMLO drawing parallels between what has happened historically in Mexico and what is going on today. Now, López Obrador continued in his speech and he said that, yes, FDR decided not to invade, but he said that corporations were still very brutal. And he said that the foreign corporations thought that Mexicans were born to enrich foreigners and that God put important natural resources below Me Mexico's soil to increase the fortunes in the treasure chests of the exploiters and concessionaires. And then he said that in response, and this has clear parallels to Venezuela today, right? To the coup attempt against Venezuela. And AMLO pointed out that after Cárdenas expropriated the oil in 1938, his government was forced to, quote, confront a boycott, pressures, and acts of sabotage promoted and funded by the foreign oil companies in our country. So 
the same tactics used to try to destabilize the Venezuelan government, first under Hugo Chavez and today under Nicolas Maduro, after, of course, after uh, Hugo Chavez nationalized the oil reserves that had previously been exploited by foreign corporations in Venezuela. And here uh, AMLO continued, and he said that the oil expropriation caused deep discomfort among a minority, above all among the wealthy at the time, in sectors of the middle class and in the majority of the media. It is interesting, and this is a lesson, to highlight that historically the right wing always regroups when a democratic change is trying to be carried out, and it becomes plainly intolerant, even violent, when it comes to social demands in favor of the people and control of the nation. As, as an example of this, AMLO once again criticizes the United States. He points to the overthrow of the revolutionary president, Francisco Madero. He was a supporter of the Mexican Revolution, which started in 1910. And then in 1911, the right-wing dictator Porfirio Diaz was overthrown and there were elections and Francisco Madero, which is known in, in Mexico as the apostle of democracy because he brought in democracy in the country. He was elected in 1911, but then in 1913, he was overthrown in a US-backed coup and murdered. And AMLO pointed this out in his speech. He said, quote, let us remember that the overthrow of President Madero, our apostle of democracy, relied on the intervention of the US ambassador, but that overthrow was carried out by internal right-wing groups that had previously promoted a campaign of hatred and smears consisting of ridiculing the leader, President, President Madero, in their newspapers to the point of treating him as crazy and a spiritualist. Maybe I don't need to point it out, but there are, of course, deep historical parallels, ironies in, in the U.S.-backed coup against Mexico's democratically elected revolutionary president Madero and the U.S. government's attempt to violently overthrow Venezuela's democratically elected president Maduro. But I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, history does rhyme. They say, you know, history doesn't echo, it rhymes. Well, here's a clear example. Anyway, um, AMLO continued and he pointed out that the right-wing party, the PAN, which is the conservative party that governed Mexico from 2000 until 2012, of the presidents Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderón, they were created, that party was created in 1939 as representatives of the oligarchs who opposed the, the uh, Cardenas' government, um, it's his government's oil expropriation. And finally, AMLO said in this speech, this is a very positive note to end on, he said, in this brief history, there are greater lessons. The main one is that only with the people, only with the support of the majority, is it possible to carry out a popular transformation to guarantee justice and confront the reactionaries who don't want to lose their privileges. So it's a very powerful message showing that with the support of the people, the, the left can take state power, it can win, it can defeat the right-wing oligarchy. Now, I've already gone way longer in this episode than I wanted to. I was, this is why I wanted to read it instead of translating it. But I'm not going to go on much longer here. I'm just going to do a very brief summary because I translated another very long part of his speech. And in the other part of his speech, AMLO also boasted of the unprecedented social spending that his government has carried out in social programs, supporting pensions for the elderly, people with disabilities, single mothers, peasants, fishermen, scholarships for students from poor families, internet for everyone, housing products, favorable loans, fertilizers, guaranteed prices for small farmers, the wellness bank, public education, healthcare, universal and free. And 71% of Mexican households are benefiting from these social programs. Because of this, they've been able to reduce crime. He, he says that the price of gasoline and electricity has not increased in Mexico. It's been frozen. The government has invested more than $1 trillion, one, sorry, 1 trillion pesos, excuse me. The government has invested more than 1 trillion pesos in building roads, bridges, trains, airports, hospitals, parks, sports facilities, etc. The minimum wage has increased by 90% and has more than doubled at the border. 
And he said that, you know, the right wing oligarchy claimed that if he raised the salaries, there was going to be inflation. But no, he said that in addition to increasing the wages, Mexico is also trying to bring about self-sufficiency in strengthening the internal market and internal consumption with food self-sufficiency and energy self-sufficiency. So Mexico no longer has to buy gasoline, diesel and other oil products from abroad. He said in Mexico, we are going to process all of our raw materials and he boasted of nationalizing lithium. Lopez Obrador also pointed out that in 2018 and 2019, he he renegotiated NAFTA, the free trade agreement that, that, that Mexico signed with the US and Canada. And he pointed out that he made the other negotiators put in a line into the negotiation that says, quote, Mexico reserves its sovereign right to reform its constitution and its domestic legislation, and Mexico has the direct, inalienable, and imperceptible ownership of all hydrocarbons in the subsoil of the national territory. And that's, of course, because um, AMLO was reversing the privatizations carried out by Enrique Peña Nieto and renationalizing the oil. And finally, he concluded his speech saying, we are going to continue with that collective conscience. We are going to continue pushing back against the dirty war, the smear campaigns, and the manipulation attempts that they will continue to carry out because they have no other choice. Our adversaries and their media outlets, which are sold out, bought up, in the hands of members of the corrupt conservative bloc. So there's a consistent theme throughout this speech where he keeps criticizing the media, which belongs to the right-wing oligarchy and lies about him. And he says, we must have faith in the wisdom and loyalty of the people. And then he finally said, I maintain that whatever they do, the oligarchs will not return to power. An authentic and true democracy will continue to prevail in our beloved Mexico. Sostengo que hagan lo que hagan, no regresarán al poder los oligarcas. So with that said, I'm going to conclude here. I'm sorry this episode went way longer than I had planned, but that tends to often happen. But I thought it was important to go through this historic speech that AMLO gave. One, there's almost no coverage of Mexico that's positive in the English language media. It's almost all negative. And there's so much media bias against Lopez Obrador, calling him like a wannabe dictator and all this ridiculous propaganda, despite the fact that he is one of the most popular leaders in the world and he was democratically elected. As always, you can find all of the sources. You can find links to them in the article that I published at geopoliticaleconomy.com. And I have that linked in the description below. If, if you like the work that we do here, please consider going to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, or you can go to patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy and you can become a donor. We have no large donors, no institutional support. We're completely independent. We rely on viewers and listeners like you. I'm Ben Norton. This is Geopolitical Economy Report. I want to thank everyone and I'll see you next time.